You take Gotti, for example. I was going to do a heist in the airport. It was identical to the Lufthansa thing. So Lufthansa was done in 78. Foxy Girodi, who was best friends with Gene Gotti, said, hey, come with us. We're going to go in the airport and do this heist. Gene went back and told John, says, Ubas is crazy. He's going to get killed. He has a death wish. Do not do that heist. This is Inside the Life with Giovanni and Dutch, produced by the Mob Museum, presented by Levy Online and Levy Production Group. Giovanni Rocco and Dutch McAlpin are former police and federal task force operatives. They infiltrated drug cartels, outlaw motorcycle groups, and the mafia. Now, they share their stories, along with others who have gone inside the life. I'm running on my own. I'm solo on this one. Uh, Dutch had a prior engagement, so I missed him on this, but so many amazing insights and stories into what it was like to be around the mob in the 70s and the 80s. He was in a high-level associate of the Colombo family. He shares stories of his interactions with the Gottis, and he shares interactions with the uh, Gambino family, the crime family, and how everything worked. And his Sinatra Club, uh, that's an exciting story, how he created the Sinatra Club, and that was like common ground for all five families to, to come and just interact with each other, not commit crimes together, but just talk about different things and 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 live and talk about the life that they were, uh, little things they had going on. He also shares some stories, some intimate stories about Gotti and the trials and what caused him to to leave the life when he became disenfranchised with the mob life and, uh, after his arrest and time in prison in Lewisburg, uh, his experience around Jimmy Burke and Tommy Simone, who a lot of you might realize are the characters for the Goodfellas movie, uh, played by Robert De Niro, Jimmy Burke's character. And Joe Pesci played Tommy DeSimone. And just his n- intimate knowledge of those two people. So enjoy this one, folks. I appreciate it. Thanks well, for thanks. coming and thanks for making the time to come and visit us at the museum here in Vegas. Yeah. The life that you had coming up, you're born and raised in, in the city of New York, right? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah. So um, you, were, you served in the military. Um, I did, Marine Corps. Yeah. Right. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Uh, you got out of the service pretty fast, though, right? A couple, you, two you years, able, yeah. Right? And you were able to get out of there on a, on a psych disability? Well, I had some other issues that, uh, you know, have come to surface now. Somehow I got hepatitis C. Mm-hmm. I was part of that Camp Lejeune thing. Oh, okay. I was there for a couple of years. Right. And I had, uh, you know, a heart condition. I had a lung condition. And eventually I was, you know, pretty radical in those days. They discharged me. Honorable discharge, but, you know, they said, Hey, this guy's a little psychiatric. Oh, right. well, certainly, I didn't agree then, but when I look back, yeah, I was a half a bubble off. Okay, all right, <laughs> yeah. right. And uh, but it follows you because the nickname Sally Umbats, right? Umbats comes from. Did it come from that episode, or did it come from something? Uh, else? It came later on down the road. Right. Uh, Umbats being crazy, yeah, you crazy. Know. Which crazy. is not a bad street name to have, Sal. Yeah, you know, especially the life that you lived. At least, you know, if people knew you as Sally Umbats, it gave them pause. Right. I would think, right? What is After, this guy going to do now? Yeah. yeah. If they, yeah. Why they call him crazy, right? Yeah. And again, I knew guys, they were called, you know, they, whether they were crazy this or crazy that. It always gave me a yeah. sense of pause to like, why? why yeah, when you think so? of crazy, you think crazy yeah. Joe Gallo. Yeah. I mean, everybody knew. Your life in Brooklyn coming yeah. up, were you exposed to the mafia? Obviously, you were back then, right? Your your childhood. Much like Bronx Tale, I had an uncle that brought me to crap games when I was a little kid. Your Uncle Tony. It's identical, yeah. My right. Uncle Tony, okay. who was went to jail with Sonny Frenzies in mm-hmm. the bank robbery uh, case in the 60s. Right. So my uncle took me to these, you know, gambling uh, dens where they, they gambled yeah. crap games on the floor. And I learned about that stuff. It was so ironic the way that Chaz Palminteri you know, conveyed the message of the life and yeah. the little kid. Right. Because there was a time when little kids looked up to the guys in the mob like they were heroes. It's funny you say that because a lot of times our, our guests on the show, it seems to be a common theme that we yeah. talk about the neighborhood and the culture right. and, and growing up, whether you grew up in the Midwest or once you were around that neighborhood, that tight knit neighborhood and you learn the ins and outs, again, growing up in Jersey and New York and have that exposure, right. you could go either way. You know, and a lot of times in our neighborhoods, you became law enforcement, you became a fireman, or you became a gangster or a street exactly. thug, right? Yeah. Um, but your, was it your Uncle Tony's influence and his exposure that you kind of started drifting that way towards Yeah, the I mean, you could underworld? see, I mean, in the 60s, you, everybody has to understand how secretive that life was in the 60s, the 70s. And so you, you were 
as fascinated with it mm -hmm. as the guys inside the life. Yes. Okay. And there was a quiet type of respect that followed those guys around. It okay. really did. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the fancy clothes, the the cars, mm -hmm. diamond rings, and the money. Right. Talk about Omerta for a second. Omerta is the code of silence, right? The oath right. that you take. Even growing up as a kid, I never witnessed Omerta being that secret oath that right. everything is kept secret. Um, were there a lot of leaks throughout the families? You being an associate. You know, you got to understand my position was I was with this guy, Cataldo, who was a Colombo guy. Mm -hmm. And I was always protected by him for more than one reason. One reason was he knew I had the gall to go out and do things. The other was we were secretly dealing drugs when you never talked about it. Right. So uh, once I got involved with the Gotti group, when they came to this little club I created, which was called Sinatra Club, Sinatra club. I was allowed to do certain things with them, but not to share our inner secrets, right. which was the drug dealing. Okay. And so, you know, Gotti wanted me to go over there with him, and Cataldo wouldn't let go of me because I was you were moving heroin right. with him, you know. Yeah, secretly, that, right? You were, yeah. He knew you were moving heroin. Exactly. And if you're not making money on any other scams, if you're not extorting, you're not right. doing bookmaking or loan sharking right. back then, yeah, the money's got to come in. Right. They, they don't have a bad month and go, yeah, don't worry about it, you yeah. know. And in those days, it was really, you know, very free-spirited, uh, it wasn't a matter of six months when I created the Sinatra Club. Gotti had got out of jail the first time. He came in there, and Faticos came in there, and Willie Boy Johnson and yeah. Gene Gotti. They all came in there to gamble because we had two or three tables of poker, which, you know, escalated to, like, you know, large pots in those days. Right. Hundreds of dollars was a lot of money in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I also got involved with Jimmy Burke. Oh, wow. Yep. And That's Tommy we DeSimone and Foxy Girodi, and we became a hijacking crew. Yeah. And we were good at it. So the Sinatra Club, were all these guys coming to your club, and, and that was understood to be a home base, a safe place where guys can come and just be around right. each other? You know, Even though the there was mob wars going on, yeah. they would come in there, and you know, all the social clubs in New York City had open doors. Yeah. Ours was a locked door. We had two doors. Okay. You couldn't get in. Right. And so we gambled in there, and a lot of crime discussions are there. And Gotti, when he first came out, he was only, God, he was uh, 32 years old. I was 27, 28. Mm -hmm. And he was just moving up slowly, not a made guy, okay. with with an image. That's, yeah. He was selling an image. That's what he was doing. From I day mean, one. Much like Santa Claus. You know? Right, right. Everybody believed in Santa Claus, you know, until yeah. you got a little bit old and you found out there is no Santa Claus. But nobody wanted to find out the real reason that the mob existed. Mm -hmm. But there was many elements to it it was about power right greed money image but who allowed that sinatra club was there one that's your club and it was your idea to create it but did yeah. somebody give it a nod did somebody touch it and say yeah this is it i'll allow this well, to happen at that point 72 uh, colombo had already been shot and so the boss of the colombos at that time was a guy named joe pegleg broncata mm -hmm. and i had just started to visit him at his house with Dominic to bring him some money. Okay. You know, bring him a little envelope of money every couple of weeks, you know. Right. And he knew what we did there. So there was a sit down between uh Brancato and the uh, Faticos. Mm -hmm. That was all set up. That was okay. good. You know, it was right. sort of a joint Colombo Gotti thing. Uh but it was quiet. Okay. It was pretty quiet. And then other guys came in there. Jimmy Burke and Tommy D. Simone. So for our, our viewers who are watching that's the folks that the characters were portrayed. Tommy's character was portrayed by, by Joe Pesci. Right. And Robert De Niro played Jimmy Burke's character in Goodfellas. And, and I liked the movie, but I was disappointed in the characterization of the characters. That's what Believe I Believe me, Jimmy Burke was the sharpest street, street smart guy, whether he was Italian or Irish, and he was Irish. This guy had contacts all over. He had respect because... You know, Vario was his boss, and he got away with all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he he mentored yeah. Tommy DeSimone, you right. know. In the Sinatra Club, did you have incidents like that scene with the Tommy DeSimone being all, flying off the handle and no, he wasn't. Or? No, he wasn't that radical around us. Okay. I think I was instructed to be very cool when I went to the Bergen, which mm -hmm. is John's Bur club. Yeah. And I think Tommy was cool. Look, hey, you got to be cool when you go to the Sinatra Club. I don't think he was ever really frequenting John's club, the Bergen. There was okay. something there that wasn't right from the beginning. But, you know, when we sat down to put the trio together, he was allowed 
to do this crime with us. Right. He was just beginning some of his radical behavior in the, I should say, early 70s. Mm -hmm. time. So you think he had a, he had aspirations for the minute he started in the life that he was he wanted to be on a trajectory to, to He move did up. because he he liked killing. Yeah. And uh in contrary, I I wasn't interested in killing. I never killed anybody. I didn't see anything any value in it. I actually felt we didn't have the right to take somebody's life. But with Tommy, I think he developed this personality that he he wasn't called crazy Tommy, but he was really wacky. The right, guy right. was a wacky Hair guy. Trigger. He was also a fun guy. Okay. We did a lot of things that were fun. Right, right. So now your earnings with the Sinatra Club, you had that going. But now some of my research I, I did, you were robbing banks too at some point, right? Was yeah, that early 71, on? 72, 73. In 71, I had been introduced to two characters. I called them in my book the geriatric twins. Right. These guys were in their 60s and they were robbing banks like Bonnie and Clyde times. And so when they got out, they were actually two guys that were released from Alcatraz. Oh, wow. And they were like 59, 60 years old. So I robbed the bank with them because they couldn't jump over the counter. You know, we went and we did this quick <laughs> bank robbery and then I learned from them a certain amount. And then I said, look, you know, you guys don't even want to plan a getaway. You just want to go and rob the bank and like- I figured it out okay. later. I did learn from them. Then I went on to do bank bank robberies with Tommy. Okay. Tommy DeSimone. It was, we were going out to rob a bank and Froxy and I, were following Tommy. Tommy was in a hot car. We were in another car, and he went through a red light. And I said to, to Foxy, Foxy Girodi, which was a John Gotti, you know, John Gotti clone, I would call him. Right. I said, catch up to him. So we go through the red light. Motorcycle, New York City motorcycle cop comes after us. Oh, my God. In the car that I'm with Foxy Girodi, who Tommy later killed years later. Right, right. I've got handcuffs mask and now we're going to get stopped we're going to be in trouble so tommy kept going and i said to foxy just go a little bit faster and hit the brakes and skid to the side he said what are you going to do i said watch he hit the brakes we skidded to the side i went under the dashboard and threw up oh no way. i said when the guy cop comes tell him i got a bleeding ulcer yeah so he comes to the window and he goes license registration says, officer we got to get my friend to the hospital look he's he's Bleeding under the floor. There was no blood, but I threw up. Yeah. Follow me. He gave you an escort. Yeah, the motorcycle cop takes us to a hospital. Out comes the uh, gurney. He put me on a, roll me into the ER, and the cop gets another call on his radio. And Foxy says, uh, you want to come in and get our names? And all? No, that won't be necessary. I've got to go on another call. Foxy says, thank you very much. The cop says, that's what I'm here to do. Protect, protect and yourself. serve. Right. I'm in the in the ER. If and they, they only knew. Yeah, they come in. He goes, "Wow, that was a pretty cool move you made." And the doctor comes over. Okay, what do we have here? I sit up. I'm feeling better. It's time to go. So rewind a little bit. You said hot car. This way, our audience knows. Not everybody knows the terminology. So we try to break it down for them. Yeah. Hot car is the lead car, right? Hot car. Yeah, we use usually one hot car and a rental car. That's what right. we. That's your getaway car. We did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what did you do? So we you. And again, just to paint the picture, because you don't have bank robbers anymore, no. right? Because the cameras, the state of the art, the money's right. all automated and electronic. There's not, there's no money in robbing a bank anymore. So well, I yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about the '70s, they just started putting cameras. Yeah. Of course, uh, Foxy was a romantic kind of a guy, so he went and found a teller to date, so he could get inside information. Uh -huh. And she said, "Look, I got to tell you what's going on. Uh, the banks are now putting a little piece of wire on the last bill." In, in the teller's drawers. Mm -hmm. And if you pull that out, the alarm goes off. Yeah. So we knew that you know, could take it all but the last bill. Right. I mean, we did a little bit of research. So paint that picture for us. You you walk in, masks? Yeah, what'd you have the handcuffs? You I, I used in to there, do makeup. Minutes. I used to use wigs and did mustache. You? They right. used masks, yeah. Usually uh, they went to the to the bank manager and held them by gun. I jumped over the counter. I was pretty athletic. Scooped up all the money. I had a little bag. And then after that time, how do you progress into the family and earning and earning respect in the street? Hijackings. Hijackings. Now, Jimmy Burke was the master. You know, his Robert's Lounge was maybe a mile yeah. from the JFK cargo area. And Jimmy had lots of customers in his lounge, Robert's Lounge, mm -hmm. and got information. Okay. What kind of loads were you hitting? And what were you doing with the loads? Like, how did yeah. you know how to get rid of them? Well, most of the uh, stuff that we got, we got information 
Jimmy had a whole network of people there, customers. They would yeah. give information. They worked at certain terminals. You know, we knew the good stuff came from from Italy. Yeah. For watch heist, that stuff came from Switzerland. So we basically knew a lot of it wasn't a stab. Right. It was pretty well planned, you know. Okay. But occasionally there was a dry spot or dry period, and so we had to do something else. Right, right. You know. So in the in the hijacking eras, you passed on a particular job. You passed on a Lufthansa job, right? Well, okay, so we're talking, when I worked with Jimmy Burke and Tommy, 72, 73, 74. I go to prison in 74. I wind up in Lewisburg, which I'd like to talk about that sometime, yes. how important that prison part time was. Yeah. Jimmy and Tommy are in the halfway house in the summer of 78. Mm -hmm. I'm already in business. I got a real estate company, a Corvette shop a jewelry store. I made a lot, a lot of money with drugs, you know? Right. And he comes to me, Tommy. So I'm in the halfway house. We're going to get out in six or eight weeks. We got a score. I go, really? You know, I was try trying to be coy with him because I knew he killed my partner, Foxy. He killed right. him dead. And I was annoyed with that. And I had already outgrown the idea of trying to get even with him. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I'm no more heist. I'm strictly moving drugs. So, okay, we think this is going to be good. And he brought me some stuff. I had a jewelry store. I bought the jewelry off him, and that was it. It was like months had gone by until they did the Lufthansa okay. heist. But it turned out to be a disaster. Yeah. So many people killed over that. Right, and right. Uh, even up until recently, what, how many years ago, they had a trial with yeah. Vinny yeah, Sarah, who, yeah. who wound up dying anyway. Yeah. But they never found that stuff. I have a feeling... At Jimmy's daughter, who I knew, Kathy Burke, mm -hmm. she's in the jewelry business in New York. Oh. She's down, I think, in Canal Street. So, so maybe, maybe she yeah. got her hands on some of that jewelry. Right. Well, Canal Street was so open back then, right? Canal, it's still around Canal Street, yeah. New York, and all yeah. the all the fugazis, all the knockoffs and the right. pocketbooks and the shirts, but it's also known for jewelry. Right. You go down there, you had connections. Then the connections are still there. So, oh, yeah. You know. If yeah. you had a fence, it was gone in, in minutes, right? And right. It's, it's that way today. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned Lewisburg, so you did time. When did you do your bid in Lewisburg? Um, I got there. I got there in July of uh, 74. Okay. And I was only there for 13 months. Yep. And there was that scene in Goodfellas, which was very accurate. There was a room with four guys in that room. Paul Vario, Johnny Dio, who was an old-time mm -hmm. gangster. Also with the same family. And then it was Joe Armone. They called him Joe Piney, who later, years later, became Gotti Sunderboss, older guy. Okay. And then Angelo was in that room. And at that point, Angelo, uh, the previous year, 73, they killed that McBratney guy over there in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And so Angelo and John became sort of folk heroes within the mob, for, uh, okay. for getting revenge on some of the kidnappings that had gone on. They really treated Angelo well there. Okay. And for you, how did you do your time in there? You just spent it around them, or were you no, the thirteen I, months that you were there? I started to uh, I started to learn a lot about the drug business. Yeah, because there was a guy there who was fascinating. He was uh, an amazing storyteller. His name was Fat GG Louis Ingalis. Okay, and uh, because I had a friend uh, who was on the farm outside, but he would come in for lunch, and my wife would drop off some cigars with his wife. Okay. And I had these nice Dunhill cigars, and this guy would bring in two or three cigars every afternoon, and I'd give one to Fat Gigi. Okay. And, you know, Fat Gigi was a legend with himself. 56 years he got, he wound up winning his case and got out, mm -hmm. but he was part of the Harlem crew. Okay. And I listened to all the stories he had. So that was your way of ingratiating yourself into their, not for protection, but just to be around them and then just kind of survive for the Yeah, he was an interesting there. guy, you know, and yeah. everybody liked him. Right. And uh, I'd give him a cigar and he'd tell stories. Okay. <laughs> and that was right. great. Now, when you get out, um, do you get more involved in a drug game or how does that deep? That's deep when it was. That's when it, yeah. Cataldo had gone, made connections in uh, in Europe, brought in, uh, brought in heroin. Uh, he also had this contact with this Vinnie Papa guy. Okay. I had met v Vinnie Papa a few times with Cataldo before he wound up going. I think he went to Atlanta. When mm -hmm. he got killed, right? Yeah, yeah. But this was the early 70s, so I never really had the information that they were getting this stuff out of the property clerk's office until later on. 
Right. And Cataldo had this relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And I guess that stuff was pretty much pure heroin. Yeah, because the, the corruption, you know, paint the picture, the corruption in the 80s in NYPD, they had their own issues going on. On top of the mob and everything that was yeah. going on in the mob and the mob yeah. wars, now you throw the corruption into NYPD. It was and they it was had tremendous. the blue wall then the blue, too. Yeah, they didn't. the blue. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, and 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 what was going on behind it? Listen, both sides were wrong at, at that right, time. You right. know, there were so many dirty cops at the time. But again, they were trying. No, it's no excuse trying to survive. And right, you know, right. and again, that's what the mob was good at. The mob was good at getting people, whether it was DMV back in the day, Division of Motor right. Vehicles, sure. whether it was you know paying bills and the tax. You know, they had their hands in everything back then. A little yeah. harder now, but you know they they controlled everything. The mob. Yeah, we had a we had a cop on the payroll, mm -hmm. you know NYPD guy, and he just got us all the information on license plate numbers and addresses. Right. I mean, when you read the story about Casso Gas Pipe, yeah, the stuff that he did, and then he cultivated those two mafia cops. It's yeah. amazing. It's amazing what. Well, it's greed, right? Yeah. Growing up, I saw it. My, I'm yeah. third generation police, but there's cops that worked with my father, my grandfather. That you know, they they were really were gangsters, and they right. became they became cops yeah. for the mob. Well, we used know? to say they got the license to steal. Ah, without a doubt. They yeah. had the license. Some of the guys I grew up yeah. around and knew as a kid, they wound up whacking guys out for the mafia, like they yeah. were, you know, mafia cops. I wasn't on. surprised at. Uh, at the two mafia cops, what were their names again? Esposito, um, yeah, uh, Epolito Esp and Car Caracapa. Caracapa, and they yeah. I think they're both passed. Yeah, right? they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were two brutal yeah. guys that just, again, to kill, to kill like that and be yeah. cold-hearted on car stops and just killing people. What they did to the one kid, they took him out of the house. Oh, that was uh, and, Heidel. And, yeah, took him out of the house, walked him out, and then that was the last. And time how I that saw case was solved, I don't know if you know about the detail. No, it's amazing. So they took him out of the house, brought him over to gas pipe. And he tortured him and killed him. And somehow when the uh, when gas pipe flipped and he exposed Epolito and Caracapa's corrupt detectives, the mother saw those two guys on right. TV and right. she recognized them, the mother right. of Heidel. Right, right, yeah. Those stories and those intimate details, did you learn that later or were you exposed to that in the street and was it word of mouth? Previous, because it was still well-guarded secrets. But... You know, I've just shook my head every day over the last 10, 15 years, the amount of information that has now been released yeah. about all this kind of stuff. You know, even, you know, with Scarpa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually talked many, many times to uh, to Linda Scarpa, the daughter, when right. she was doing her book, The uh, Hitman's Daughter. Mm -hmm. Publisher sent me a galley edition. I read it and I commented and I tried to explain to her what she sh should be looking for once a book gets published, yeah. and she had a great story. I don't know why that's not already a movie. On top of the dope game that you were in, um, and before you testified against Gotti and all that, were you trafficking dope in and out of the country? Was it just, just more? locally. Locally. Right in New York City, yeah. Right. As I soon had a as bunch, it came over. Yeah, a bunch yeah. of dealers, you know, and they got to get it, get it out into the street. Right. Um, for years, I had total protection there. I didn't use any law enforcement to protect me. It's just that I was careful. Uh, again, that was the 70s. Uh, I picked up and left New York City in 81, 82. Mm -hmm. I went upstate New York and spent a million dollars building a racetrack. Okay. And I was, I wasn't as sharp as I was right. previously. I went back, got, in uh, got involved again with drugs, got busted, which when I look back, it's 40 years ago this month. Mm -hmm. It was probably the best thing happened to me. It sure. allowed me to get out permanently. Well, you were. When was the point you were started to become watered down and disillusioned by the mafia? And the it was in jail in in seventy four, but I didn't want to admit it to myself. I could see through all of this, you know. I could see through the corruption. I could, what really happened was I had met an old time mob guy. He was a captain in the Gambino family, and he sort of tutored me, and said, "Look, it's all changing. Get in, get out." And I didn't admit I was doing drugs mm -hmm. to him. That was. A no no. Right. But he was a, a really nice guy. He left New York, went to Florida. Uh, his name was Dave Icavetti, an interesting okay. guy. I talked a lot about him, like like a father image. Right. And I started to see the greed, the corruption within within the mob, not corruption to do with the P D or other, anything. Right. Right. And the and the jealousy yeah. and how they were killing for money. And and it, it panned out when Angelo wind up ordering a guy to get killed guy named db if you know that story yeah. mm -hmm. that's a terrible story yeah yeah 
Well, that's the tape that burned Gotti too. When Gotti talked about it in the in the social club upstairs in the apartment, right? He right. mentions DB, and you know, what do we do? Why do we kill him? That's the whole conversation that burned him. Yeah. In the end. Yeah, I funny, never right? even spoke with uh, Sam Gav Sammy Gravano, but he told a story that he was on the outside, and Angelo would go visit John, and Angelo created this story, a lie, mm -hmm. and said this guy DB was, you know, subversive. He was right. going to start to try to take over the family, and then Gotti told him, go tell Sammy to take him out. Yeah. Well, the real deal was Angelo borrowed 250000 for him, and that's yeah. why he wanted him dead. Mm -hmm. So it was, again, greed. Yeah, yeah. I saw that growing up. We, you know, I talked about it in on previous episodes. It's easier to kill somebody that owed you money back then. In those days. You know? Yeah. If, if a guy owed you forty grand, it was like, well, listen, he's not paying you. You're not going to get that money. Just kill him. Right. Or if you owed it to somebody, it's like, listen, it's, it's easier just to get... You know, I remember taking statements off of guys that did hits and... And they were like, yeah, listen, it's just easier to kill them. You know, yeah. it was just like that. The mafia was really at their strongest in that time period when you were out there running around. 70s, yeah. 80s. And the time that you decide to leave that life. Yeah. You, there's no leaving the life back then. I mean, you know, That's you, left right. to, you left by jail, by going to life or prison, yeah. or you left by getting whacked out or, you know, how did that happen? What did that look like when you go, you know well, what? Well, I met I'm a guy out. that I was impressed with. I had read about him. And it's really interesting how you meet someone and usually in the life, whether it's legal or illegal, but this guy was law enforcement. And I read about him, and I had listened to my attorney at that point, like in the 70s, that this guy named Mike Coro, who wound up being Gotti's attorney and going to jail and dying anyway, and he'd say, boy, this Ed McDonald, this Ed McDonald, he's a special task force, and he's a, he's a spitfire. I mean, he's just a pathfinder. He wants to get all the mob guys. Yeah. So I got out of jail and I met him in the summer of 84. And we sat down and talked like we're talking here. Of course, you know how to debrief someone. Mm -hmm. You start talking about somebody named Joe Black. And before yeah. you know it, you're talking about, you know, Benny Eggs. Yeah. I mean, it just goes all over the place. And what McDonald saw in me was I had all these contacts on the street. He went back to the U.S. attorney at the time. He's a federal judge now, a okay. guy named Deary, and said, I got this guy. He would be the perfect setup to do a sting. Right. Like, like Pistone did. Yeah. Okay? He knows, but he's even deeper. And then uh, this guy, Deary, who was U.S. attorney, well, what has he really got? He's got this judge. So maybe a week went by, and then Deary went back to McDonald. You can't have him. We're taking him. And then I got to meet a couple FBI agents and I got to meet uh, Diane Jack alone. Jack alone. Okay. okay. But there was another, you know, assistant U.S. attorney who took the case. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, this is not, not an easy case. You, we're talking about a New York State Supreme Court judge. We got to get special, you remember Title Threes. Yes. You got to yes. get special authorization. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they did a lie detector test on me and I had paid off this judge. You know, I, I stayed in touch with McDonald, and I wasn't involved with him for the, the Judge Brennan case. And I testified against Brennan in 85 because I flipped in 84, and I'm in the program now. Yeah. Like two years goes by, and I get a call from the U.S. Marshals. We're flying you to, oh, I guess it was like Cedar Rapids, mm -hmm. Michigan or something. Well, what am I going to do in Michigan? you got to meet this U.S. attorney. So I go up to Michigan. Who's there? Diane Jackalone and John Gleason. John Gleason. A young John Gleason. And he's just taking notes and she's asking me all these questions. She said, look, we have a Gotti case. I go, yeah. You're going to be the first witness. I go, really, why? And it's the first time I heard the word. You are a polished raconteur. She got the best stories. You're the best storyteller. Yeah. And when you're going to be the first witness in the Gotti case. I mean, what Gotti case? well, we're going to drop an indictment soon and we want you to, uh, I don't want to testify against Gotti. I don't have anything negative to say. Well, it's not about testifying against him. You're going to paint a picture of what the life was like. Mm -hmm. Subject matter expert. So I get into a, a battle with her and I call the FBI agent guy. He says, look, you signed an agreement. Read the agreement. Fine print. Yeah, you, you're you going to testify in any trial we wow. deem you necessary. Or, or what? Well, I, I got to get sentenced. I'm still yeah. waiting to get sentenced by Weinstein. Right. You know? So anyway, I went back there. I did that case. I did Joe Messina's case. Uh, I did a couple of cases. And, you know, I finally got sentenced to probation. 
And, of course, Gotti won that case. And when he won, it was uh, Friday the 13th, 1987. Right. He was a hero in New York City. Fireworks. Yeah, the whole, everything. The whole everything. Yeah. The whole so for the next five years, you know, everything was good for him until they had good wiretaps. They had sophisticated surveillance. You guys had a lot of great stuff by yeah, 19, of course. 1990. But what does that look like for you? What, what? So now Gotti goes free. Yeah. And everybody's watching the news and everybody's cheering him on. You go back to wherever you're living now and yeah. witness protection. Well, luckily, I had split with my first wife, and I wound up in Hollywood using a, using a Jewish name as a writer. Mm -hmm. I had three names there in Hollywood. Okay. So you'll never see my name on IMDb from the first few things I did, right. which later I sold a couple of scripts. I sold a script with Henry Hill yeah. for television. Okay. Uh, what was her name? Lorraine Brocco played... Uh, Played a prosecutor, played oh, Diane really? Jack alone. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I sold a TV script, and then I used the second name until Gotti died. Then I went back to my real name. Right. But during that time, when when Gotti's still out, the whole Willie Boy Johnson thing happened. So we had John Gleason on the show, and we did an episode yeah. with him. We talked about the Willie Boy Johnson oh, killing and everything. But does that affect you? Because you know, like, Willie Boy, after him getting whacked out for testifying, yeah. or flipping, he, he didn't go into WITSEC, but... Was there concerns that they were going to come for you? I mean, as sharp as he was, I thought about that. You know, would they bother? But you know what? I testified against a guy, Gotti, in a trial where he won the case. Mm -hmm. He had other fish to fry. But as sharp as Willie Boy was, and I did some things with him, I cannot believe he didn't think that they were going to kill him. Yeah. You know, but they waited. You know, they waited. Sure. Time went by. Mm -hmm. and Yeah, that's what they do. Right. Yeah. Did they ever reach out? Did you ever have any kind of like uh, anybody send you a message? Uh, obviously, in WITSEC, you're not allowed to have contact, right? So we'll paint the picture for the the, the audiences. You're not allowed to have contact. But once you're in WITSEC yeah. um, and the marshals take you into custody, you're not supposed to contact anybody else. Or we'll go your, back to the danger zone. Right. And yeah. and really, you know, in my, my experience in WITSEC, the marshals try to, it's not that they try to jam you up. But the minute you make a call, they give you three strikes, three warnings, right. and they kick you right out. Right. You know, because they got to make room for the next group coming right. in. Right. Yeah. You violated your agreement. And right. Yeah. I mean, listen, I was a rebellious guy. I never followed rules. The, the minute I got to Texas, I violated some of the, the rules that they had laid out. You know, I didn't have a driver's license, but I went and bought a car for my wife. Right. I mean, I wasn't there. If, I mean, it's interesting how things, you know, happen, but uh, I laughed at some of those U.S. Marshals. I actually reported to Ed McDonald for 20 years about my life. Really? Yes, I did. Okay. I told him, I'm going to tell you this. I don't need to tell anybody. I'm never going to commit a crime again. He said, wow. So over the years, I keep him abreast of what was going on with my wife, my family and all, my new life and all. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 09, I did this movie and I called him. I said, I got a part for you in the movie. You're going to play this Catholic priest who's corrupt. Okay. He said, you're kidding. I said, no. And we did the movie in L.A., and we flew him into the, into L.A. We have fun, and uh, I'm still friends with him. Okay. After yeah. all these years. Yeah. Did it have a serious impact? Because I know my experiences, and I want to know because, again, my family was moved, right, because of my case, and I ended my infiltration with the mafia. The impact it had on my family was severe. I carried a lot of guilt for a while. It, you it know, took me I, a I was the guy who could let go of guilt. Yeah. I mean, really... Um, I think it hurt my sons more than I knew because right. they were teenagers. And, uh, you know, I got them to college. Mm -hmm. Both of them were football players. They were really good at it. They played D1 football. Um, my first son played on the 1990 National Championship Colorado team. Okay. I would never say that years ago. Yeah. Um, my second son w really missed his calling, probably should have been a football coach forever, became an IT engineer. Okay. And uh, at 51, two years ago, he had a heart attack and died. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I was touched by Sorry. that. It always hurt me deeply. But him and I really, you know, reconnected over yeah. the years. It's funny that you, you say that, you know, you shared that. You're finally able to share that. Yeah. Because I'm still in that phase of, you know, those moments. And, and again, platforms like this, yeah. it's healing for us. I find yeah. this to be, you know, to be able to sit down and talk and share these moments and share this history. Yeah. It's, not, it's not to gloat about it. No. And it's not to tell other people's stories. I think people don't realize, unless you've been through something that we've been through, yeah. you know, when you leave that life, whether it's the law enforcement life, it's hard enough for law enforcement. Because again, we're in the mob museum, but the mob museum is also the museum of law enforcement, you know? Right. So it's the history of both. 
So just like a cop retires, it's hard for him to leave that job. It's Absolutely. hard for any gangster to leave the life, right? When is the right yeah. time to leave? When am I going to retire? Some guys are in it forever. They, they're there like cops. They're there till the day they die. They, they die on the yeah. job. It's a lot for mobsters too. But for us, it was that sudden unplug, and then you have to reinvent yourself, you know, along That's the way. That's what you really got to do. Are you about 50 now? Yeah, I'm yeah, in my 50s, yeah. 50s. Yeah. So I got out of that life in 80. 485 I was 39 right so i was in 39 now i'm out 39 i'm right. gonna be 79 next yeah. the end of this month yeah so i look at it like well you know there's a lot of things i shouldn't have done but you can't change it no you know the no. best that you can do did i ever think that it was really because all oh, this is going to become uh, you know historical no but it is and there is a lot of people that listen to this stuff yes yes you know the podcast and hopefully yeah and that's why i look at it and say hopefully people listen to our stories and our experiences yeah. and realize when they're at that pivotal moment right like we talked about it off camera before we started you know making fast money making fast money is easy right. making legitimate money yeah. legitimate money is yeah. fun it's good it's creative yeah but the fast money is sometimes what the youngsters are drawn to and, and i laugh because you know i had friends straight people I had a guy I met in the 70s who had a pizza joint in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He needed money to open up another pizza joint. So I said, well, how much money do you need? He goes, I don't know. I go, what about 25000 He says, yeah, that would help. So I, I said, just a minute. I went and got a 25000 put it in the bag, gave it to him. So how much interest I got to pay? No interest. You're my friend. Yeah. So he Not goes ahead, and opens a second, opens a third. Yeah. He got 40 trucks in Bergen County with little ovens on the back delivering okay. you know, pizzas and making a lot of money. He got very rich. But aside from that, we were both involved in racing. And I had come up with a little additive um, tool for a carburetor one day and had a spring on it. He goes... What are you going to do with that? I said, oh, no, we use it, you know, for our little go-kart. You know, he says, well, could I make it and sell it? I go, oh, like you, this is 45, 50 years ago. You're going to make this and sell it. Right. I go, for what? He's $7. I go, here, keep it. So he sold that for 30 years. 30 years. 30 sold. years, right. right. And one day I said to him, hey, I need some money for a little while. I guess, send me 25000 mm -hmm. So he sent me the 25000 When I opened the envelope, the check was in a company and I called the, t the little tool a Flex T and it said Flex T Company. Oh, no way. So then I, you know, got a hold of him one day. So said, tell me something. How much money did you take in for 30 years? Yeah. It's about 250000 Right. He goes, and that 25000 is yours. Oh, really? <laughs> After all those years, you know, yeah. I invented something and hadn't thought much about slow nickels. Right. He made the slow nickels. Slow nickels, know? yeah. 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 So it was another creative thing that I discounted. Okay. Because I was always looking for the big score. The big score. Yeah. yeah. The fast money coming in, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can have this because I got something bigger coming down the pipe. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, regrets. Any regrets? Nah, not really. I mean, I, you know, I look back, I can't change how my kids, my oldest son is 56. My son just died two year and a half ago. He was 51. Not really. I try to do all the apologies I could, you know, do over the years yeah. and I was wasteful. I have a great wife now, and um, I work at her future. Yeah. I didn't think about futures mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago. Living in the moment. No. Right. Always yeah. living in the moment back then. In the moment, yeah. yeah. Well, because that life, and I, I, I could only imagine the stress. Because yeah. you were you were associated with Columbo's, but you're bouncing around with all these other Borgatas, all these oh, other yeah. families. We, you know, Messina, and, Joe Messina and right. all. You know, yeah. oh, do me a favor. Give right. a guy a job. I go, this is 78 or 77. Hey, who's the guy? So I'll send him to your car shop. I had a Corvette shop. Guy comes in and says, hey, Joey sent me. I go, what's your name? He said, Goldie. Yeah. What do you do? He says, oh, I'm really good car thief. Okay, I'll give you a list every every week I want these cars. So he was stealing cars for a couple of years. Then I went in the program, forgot about Goldie. One day I'm reading the New York Post. I'm going, oh my God, look at this story. This is about a guy named Goldie. I saw his real name. After 40 years. Really? And what does that indicate is in the life when somebody said, oh, this is Joey uh, Joey Apples. Yeah. You never knew Joey Apples' name. Nope. For all those years. Yeah. yeah. There's guys I look back and I didn't know their name when I was in it. Isn't you that know, Everybody had a nickname. You know, yeah. everybody had something, Knuckles yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, but but it's funny because it's all on vouchers. 
But then again, you're on the hook. You're right. on the hook for that too. Yeah. Like you had mentioned before, listen, I'm going to give you this idea. Right. I don't want anything. I'm not going to charge you any interest. Right. The guys used to say that. I got nervous. Like, yeah, there was something. It's there. a gentleman's loan. No, listen, I'm doing well, Sal. Here's some money. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know they're going to come knocking. Uh, it's only you know, that didn't happen. I mean, I went back in, in 82 and I saw John Coniglia, who made mega, mega, by the way, he's free. Oh, okay. Mega millions in the, in the dope business, right? Yeah. I go, John, I need some money. How much you need? 25000 Here. I go, how much? He said, oh, give me two fifty a week. That was a point. That was like a gift. Yeah. So I took that 25000 and bought Coke, and I was flipping it, and you know, I made a bunch of money. I gave him half the money back. Then when I got busted and I got out, this FBI agent says, hey, look, you got to pay the guy back for that loan. I said, I got to go talk to him. Mm -hmm. I go to meet John Canigli, and this is like, say, a year and a half before the Gotti trial, which he wound up being on that trial. Yeah. And I go to his car lot, and I go, John, you know what? I got lawyers. He's, you got lawyers. I go, look, that 15000 I got a piece of property up there. I'm going to sell it. He's, don't even worry about it. Forget the interest. You get it, you get it, you give it to me, you know? When I went back, McDonald listened to the tape. He goes, that doesn't sound normal. Right. They usually want to strangle you. I go, John liked me. <laughs> I never gave him the 50000 right. But on the tape was one of the funniest things we ever heard. Yeah. He had this attorney who was a former Queens district attorney, and mm -hmm. he was talking bad about him. He called him every, every curse word you could think of. The guy's ripping me off. Now, two years later, we're at the Gotti trial. They played that tape. Really? And the attorney's sitting next to him. Sitting right next yeah. to him, and he's bad-mouthing him. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, you know, all the attorneys that God he had. Yeah. I had Shargell, he was my attorney. I had Corio, he was my attorney. Okay. And they ripped them off, and eventually, with the tape, tapes they had, yeah. they, they weren't allowed on the second trial. Right, Shargell right. Shargell and uh, Cutler. Right, because it was Cutler, right. You, of course, lived a full life inside the mob. Mine was a brief moment in time. I infiltrated the mafia on a number of times, but then the one case I did, the big case was, yeah, I'm talking over a period of almost three years, nearly three years, but in that time, I my trajectory was so fast because the way I came in right. as an associate, as an earner, that's, and again, as associates, and you and I shared our common bond, we weren't made guys and we weren't trying to get made. By no means was I trying to get made when I was undercover with right. the mafia. You were a good earner. I wasn't a great earner. Um, I had things coming in, swag, knockoff right. stuff, cigarettes, and the, the jackings and the, and the hijacks and the, the stolen freight that we had. Um, but once guys see you, I know they started fighting over me. Like in the family, in the De Cavacantes, I was dealing with two different guys. They started, they, I, had a, I forced a sit down. Did you? And I didn't intend to force a sit down. And they had an argument over who I was going to be with. Right. Right. And when you're that, when you're swimming in those waters, it's so murky and so ugly because as long as you're earning. And right. then eventually I was given the task of killing a guy within the family. Yeah. And if they ever decided to not do that, and again, I make that point because you had so much intimate knowledge inside the Sinatra Club and the conversations that you heard. Right. If you were present for a conversation, overheard it, and not being a made guy, that's enough right there. Yeah. Where if they were like, you know, Sal shouldn't have heard what he heard, or Giovanni heard something right. he shouldn't have heard, right. you gotta, he's got to go. We got to whack him out, you know, or you're not earning enough. We can't forget the victims, right, that we right. leave behind. A lot of times I say to myself, like the, the, the jackings we did or the thefts that we did, right. even when we did, there, were no, there was nobody around. The impact we had on the retail side of things. We were hitting trucks that were, you know, full of Timberlands or full of Uggs at the time. They sell like hotcakes in the street, right. you know, but the impact it had on, on the retail sector. Uh, and I, on that impact, I will tell you this. I was on the stand seven days in the Gotti trial. And one of the guys that I had working for me, he was great. He was so loyal. He was a tough guy. What I didn't know, because I went into the program 84, and now I'm testifying against Scotty 86, was that this guy named Victor, his name was Victor Cusati. And towards the end of my testimony, Cutler got up, oh yeah, Mr. Polisi, one more question. Did you know Victor Cusati? I go, yes, very well. What did Victor Cusati do for you? Well, to be perfectly honest, he was a heroin user. And occasionally he would get addicted. But at times he would kick, a, kick the habit. And he, I said he would test my heroin. How would he do that? He would sit in front of me and I'd have three or four different mixtures. 
And then when he knew that that stuff was really powerful, yeah. he said, oh, it hit me in the back of the head. His voice changed. It's like, oh, my God, this is good. He would go. And I'd say, okay, that's what we're going to start selling for a little while. Because once you put that out on the street, yeah. the drug users use it. It takes two, four, five weeks, and they're addicted to it. And then they're building a tolerance. So you got to change the mix. Is you do know that you killed him. The courtroom got silent. Mm. I looked at Cutler, and all I said to him was, excuse me? You're not supposed to negotiate Answer, yeah. conversation with a defense right. attorney. You killed Victor Casati. He was found dead last year, and Cutler didn't want to hear, or the court didn't want to hear. I was in the program, and I was hiding out under a new name in Texas for two years. Right. They figured I gave him drugs and he killed himself. Of mm -hmm. course, he was an addict, you know, but he was a good guy. He cared about my wife and kids, and I liked the guy, and I kept telling him, stop using drugs. He would deliver the drugs to me. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, I'd hit him over the head with a little bat, and yeah. he'd bleed, and i say, you're not supposed to use the drugs. Stop using Now, go get straight. He would go get straight, and one time I tied him in a basement to dry him up. Okay. So I liked the guy. Right. And that was one of the casualties of drugs. A very sad story when it he is. died. I'm sure his his mother and sisters, he wasn't married, but he was a good guy, stand-up mm -hmm. guy. I mean, this guy would have took a bullet for me. Right, right. Yeah, but, it, you know, when you're addicted and you're suffering from addiction, you know, it's uh, you can help them. But, but again, that's the life of, of crime. You know, right. you do put drugs right. in the street, and, you know, they're filling their gangsters, they're filling their pockets. They right. don't care about the impact it has. They don't care yeah. until it hits home with them. Right until and even everything that goes on today with the fentanyl and all this stuff, oh, you know, um, the, the the powerful drugs you put out in the street yeah. back in the day, like the mafia put out in the street, yeah. it, it, the the impact is severe, you yeah. know, um, yeah, and it's just well, you know, what we put out in the street, we didn't want to have it out there where it would kill anybody. You just wanted them to get hooked on yep. it, and I would change the mixture. I would have to mix that stuff with quinine. So they would scratch. Mm -hmm. I knew the effects of mixing. Right. Well, I wasn't a, you know, a scientist, but I knew how to mix that stuff and I right. knew how to stretch it. Well, there was a profit in it. When you say stretch it, the profit step is on it, step yeah. on it. You're yeah. stepping on it. You're cutting it. Yeah. You're putting, you know, if if they had, you know, other things they would put inside, like laxatives and stuff like that. They yeah. Put inside. Oh yeah. Yeah. Make your money because you'd buy it off of somebody. You were buying it pure. I was getting it from Cataldo. It was pure. Yeah, it was pure. So I can make you know, thirty grams out of one. Yeah. That the money and the profit was insane huge. back then. Yeah. Huge money. I mean, in the 70s, if you made 20, 25,000 a week, that was a lot of right. money. But now, how much of that did you have to kick up? None. None. They no, I stored Cataldo's heroin. So I did a lot of things for him to help him out. Right. I just pay him the cash money. I was paying him maybe 5,000 an ounce, mm -hmm. which is 150,000 a kilo. Right. But he was probably getting it for 20 or 30. So he was making money on what he gave me. And by the time I stretched it out and sold it, wow. Yeah. Your time with Gotti and testifying to him. Again, did you ever have that fear that he was going to come after you? You know, I thought it was probably a possibility, but I didn't know where he was going, where the government was going. In a matter of a year or two or three, he was so busy with all his criminal cases, he didn't have time to chase me down, you know, right. and, he, and he won that case. Right, right. He didn't get yeah. convicted and go to jail. It was Sammy who, who did the damage. Right. Yeah. And people don't realize when you're dealing with so many, so many people who have the propensity for violence, they, they some don't have respect for human life, right? They'll take a life as fast as they, you know, as, right. as, as you got it, it was given to you. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not easy waters. No. A guy like Gas Pipe, to, oh, to live wow. in a time with Gas Pipe who just, wow. it was murder and mayhem type of guy. Yeah. Gas Pipe was a lunatic. A lunatic? Um, I mean, he set the bomb up on Frank De Chico's car. Yeah. God, he was supposed to be at that meeting. They were supposed to be in a meeting. So, I mean, right. you know, and bombs were off, you know, they were off ideas right. in those days. Some of the hijackings, again, we're not giving away tradecraft. I'm not telling you, we're not trying to give a, a one-on-one tutorial on how to rob a bank. When you robbed a bank, you went in like the old guys that you were around, the old, old guys. Yeah. They were like Westerners. They, they walked That's in, right. you had a mask on, you walked in. Right. You could not get away with that today because today you rob a bank, you left your DNA behind. There's a way for the government to come in and, and literally capture oh, yeah. particles out of the air and, and get DNA out of the mm -hmm. air. There's we, no way you can do it. We never thought of such. I mean, the high techs, you know, 
surveillance that you guys have, the undercover, you know, operatives that you work right. with, the information, you know, when you meet someone to to talk about crime like within the government, like McDonald, there was so much that he knew that I didn't know and how they how you guys connect it, you know, when you somehow learn yeah. later on some of these yeah. relationships that took place yeah and i learned listen i learned a lot from the mob as we went along when we did yeah. these hijackings or we did these thefts and we took a, a trailer a 53 53 foot container out of a yard someplace they have the the things on top you yeah. know the trackers and the gps and all that you, you can't yeah you know but they the guys still try and they get caught and they get put in jail for it because yeah. again it's the greed it's the the sexiness of the thrill of the moment a lot of young yeah. guys have it but when you have that kind of brain, it's a criminal brain that's just, you're but, wired wrong. You know, wrong. like you take Gotti, for example. I was going to do a heist in the airport. It was identical to the Lufthansa thing. So Lufthansa was done in 78. Foxy Girodi, who was best friends with Gene Gotti, said, hey, come with us. We're going to go in the airport and do this heist. Gene went back and told John, says, Ubas is crazy. He's going to get killed. He has a death wish. Right. Do not do that heist. Well, we went on and did the heist and made a lot of money. Right. You know, we got 58,000 watches. Wow. And this was when gold, the price of gold was like $30 an ounce. Okay. I mean, so, yeah. Were you able to keep the whole score? Oh, you, no. Well, uh, what happened was I had I had determined that I didn't want to sell anything to the Gotti Fatico crew. They'd rip us off. Mm -hmm. So when we before we did the heist, we decided there was four portions. We were going to equally split all the merchandise and everybody was responsible to sell their watches. Yeah, it's funny you say that. Cause I, I did the same thing. I would try to find, or I would try to manipulate the crew that I was working with. Yeah. And I would say, look, let me find a fence. Let me find somebody that's going to middle it before we go and get it. Right. Yeah. Or a lot of times I would stage it and I would, I would put a, I would put a load of TVs yeah. and say that I had information, you know, we're going right. to go hit this trailer and, and it's got a, it's, it's filled with TVs, plasma TVs or whatever these new things are, LC, LEDs. And we would hit the truck, but I would say, look, you, you can take one each or you can each take one, but yeah. I need this. this. This is going someplace. I already have a fence for this. I'm bringing it to somebody. So I had to swim in those waters. But again, if, if it looked weird, yeah. you know, and one misstep in my world, I wasn't living in the world as a criminal. You, you were able to, I couldn't, I couldn't create violence. I couldn't threaten somebody. I couldn't, yeah. you know, the things I had to do. It was but, difficult, more difficult for you. Yeah, it was definitely more difficult I for think me because so. I live by different rules. Yeah. I had to follow government rules and, you know, there's things I couldn't right. do. And I was given criminal authority. I was able to commit crimes, but it all had to go through the U.S. Attorney's Office. I, everything I did wow. had to be authorized, you yeah. know. So, but you, it was, it was live by the seat of your pants and, yeah. you know. Yeah, we were very cavalier. You know, I mean, really, some of the stuff we did, it was interesting. And again, everybody's seen the movie Goodfellas and, yeah. and the, the portrayal of, of, Burke and D. Simone, and those those yeah. guys alone having to to swim in the same waters or breathe the same yeah. airs as those guys on a job. I like Jimmy Burke. I liked him a lot because when I was in the final few months of my sentence, they had opened a new MCC uh, on Park Row, and my wife had a deli, and I would get my wife to give Mickey, which was Jimmy Burke's wife, a whole package of you know whatever was in that package, booze. You know, salami, pepperoni, yeah. cigars, whatever. And then Mickey would take it and meet a corrupt hack that worked at MCC. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy was up there and we'd celebrate with the stuff. And Jimmy was the ultimate gangster. He was the ultimate, you know, aficionado of how to get around mm -hmm. crime, how to get around jail. I mean, he right. was just a happy go lucky guy. He was never down, he was always aggressive and. Uh, you know, positive about life. That's who he was. Yeah. He yeah. lived a wild life. And I thought his character was somewhat subdued to the guy I knew. Really? Subdued? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they portray yeah. him as a murderer and mayhem in the movie, right? Yeah, I get that part. But right, right. he had a lot of personality. Yeah. And that's what I thought was interesting well, about you him. You see so much. You hear that all the time. Like, you know, and we've talked about it on this show here. Yeah. So many guys that went into the life of, and no matter what it is, Italian, Eurasian organized crime, any any organized crime. And when they committed to that lifestyle, um, yeah, they're, they're smart. That's why they can survive yeah, for so long. Yeah, he was street smart, very yeah, street smart. Yeah, it's good to be street smart. But if he only applied himself a different way, it would have, you know, he would have been successful. Yeah, you realize that. Oh yeah. And and to go against the mafia and not against them to take them down, but just to have the 
just to have the vision to say, you know what? I've been in this for a while. Right. I tried it. This isn't me. Well, I know? didn't want my kids to follow footsteps. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't. Yeah. A lot of the guys who had kids, they followed Jimmy Burke, mm -hmm. Frankie Burke, dead. Mark Ryder, great drug dealer, nice friend of mine, his son, dead. Right. I mean, there's a lot of guys who lost their kids. They followed their footsteps. Now, the research I did before the show, um, there was a conversation you had with Gotti, am I right, where you told him that, that exact thing? I went thing? to the 1973 World Series. The Mets played Oakland, and we sat and watched the game. And my kid was five, and his John Jr. was eight, I think it was. And he said, no, my kid is never going to be involved with the mob. He said that? That's he never. He, he didn't want him. He wanted At that for point, kid. I'm going to send him to military school, which he did. He did. Yeah. But he followed his dad's footsteps. Right, right. Well, when you become your own man, you start making your own decisions, yeah. right? Yeah. But He but did yeah. prison time. Yeah. Even though he won a few cases at the mm -hmm. end, that was not a happy life. Well, listen, once the government has their sights on you, yeah. you know, it's only a matter of time. They're just going to keep picking at you. Yeah. You know, so through the seventies and eighties, um, it was known that there were five families, right? Right. And, and they, they acted independently. They acted on their own and, and everybody had the understanding or the belief. They thought they acted, they don't, they don't work together. They don't, they don't collaborate. They don't, but what you developed with that Sinatra club that allowed them to go to a common ground place right. to sit and talk and share. That was, that was, nothing's been done since then. Or well, you that. know, the Sinatra Club was lo uh, located in Ozone Park, 87th Street. John Gotti's club was on 100, 100th Street, just 13 blocks away. And then Jimmy Burke and Paul Vario, they were on Leffitt's Boulevard, which was only another 15 or 20 blocks. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, you had Lucchese's and then you had the Gambinos and then my influence with Cataldo mm -hmm. and the Gambino guys. So that was three families. Then occasionally we'd have somebody coming over from like Joe Messina from right. the Bonanno family or Funzi Terracone was uh, eventually made in Genovese family. So they all touched each other there. Right. And they were, in a way, connected to each yeah. other. It, it wasn't something that the government knew about at the time. That was no, done was in secret. It was pretty quiet. <clears throat> that was pretty secret. Yeah. It was pretty, uh, it's unique that you had developed that environment for them to come and share. I had seen it in my yeah. case. Fast forward so many years. Yeah. Um, the case that I did, Infiltrating, it gleaned a lot of intelligence because- I think they knew. They knew. Because Wooly Boy was in the club. Yeah. So they knew. I yeah. mean, but again, what a lot of people don't realize, I don't know what happened with your experience with a governmental agency. In Wooly Boy's time, the agent that he dealt with in those days, like even like Scarper, they didn't share information from agent to agent. No. It was very secretive. Yeah, yeah, because I don't want my golden goose. I don't yeah. want you to know who my golden goose yeah. is. Meanwhile, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of cross contamination. You know, yeah. they're supposed to. They're supposed. And again, I'm not giving away tradecraft. They're supposed to call other departments. But when you do, and you have a high profile uh, person, like an asset, yeah. a human asset, an informant, somebody has given you that type of information, and they're giving you those golden nuggets and and things that nobody else has. They try to keep that as close to their chest. It as was interesting because uh, my analogy with the mob, the five families, because I did a lot of insurance scams way back with people, was insurance companies did not share information. So therefore, if you had a car and it was a hot car and you registered, insured it, and it disappeared, you get paid from the insurance company. You could almost have that same car a few months later, and the other insurance companies wouldn't know that somebody paid off. Well, today, it's not that way. Everybody right. shares information, right, right. and they can track any car in about 30 seconds. Yeah, you there's know? a database with claims yeah. and what claim you I put in with what company. Yeah. Yeah, so we really didn't have to code. deal with the, with that technology that, that you have today. Well, your guys and your generation, I think, was the reason why we had to have all this technology, right? right? Because the the things that were happening back then, they had to they yeah. had to find a way, you know. Yeah, you were, you were and I had it. a cop, uh, you know, who, a detective who would get me information. I'd sell a stolen car to somebody, and I say, "Let me know when it hits the DMV," because dealer to dealer, and then he'd run the number. He said, "Oh, that car was just registered in, uh, you know, up in the Bronx. Give me the name and address," and yeah. then I'd set keep a set of keys. After it was stolen, car, go back and re-steal it right. and chop it up. And right. so there was the evidence gone. And we got a lot, we got away with a lot in those yeah. days. Yeah, we without really a doubt. Did. Yeah. Yeah. The technology Scam did. Scam for the day. Now now rewinding back to Uncle Tony. 
um, your Uncle Tony and his influence on you and the impact he had on you. Yeah. Uh, he was your introduction into this life, right? Right. So he, he did he teach you or was it an influence to do the bank robberies from him? How was that? Well, it was a short time that, you know, I was 20 years old and it was about a year or two and we had a little gambling operation. He goes to prison on with Sonny Franzese on a bank robbery charge and Cataldo, his family and my family were friends back in the 30s. Mm-hmm. So uh, Cataldo comes out and said, hey, I saw your Uncle Tony. He said, you've got a little book business. I'm going to come out. Let's be partners and we'll build a, a bookmaking big business. And that's what we did in 67 and 68. Okay. And that's how I started with him. Of course, he wasn't a made guy then, but he was involved with Persico's. He was involved with Jerry Lang. He was involved with mm-hmm. you know some heavy hitters right. in the mob, Colombo guys. It sounds similar to the experiences I had. I would say everybody thinks the mob is dead. Everything everybody thinks the mob is gone. The mob is watered down. Right. They're not gone no. by any means. And everybody says, well, there's no more mafia. There's no more, you know, there's no more organization. Um, but there is. I yeah. saw it. And exactly what you describe, I experienced in my case by guys saying to me, Look, my uncle's getting out of prison. Right. He's so and so. Like he's gonna be a captain. And I used to play it off. I used to play dumb because I played that. I didn't know a lot about the mafia. Yeah. I, you know, I'm from the streets, but, and he would say to me, he's going to be a captain. What? He's a cop? He's in the yeah. military? What do you mean he's a captain? Yeah, What's right. that? No, no, no. And they would try to convince you. They'd say, no, he's with so-and-so. Yeah. So by the time I made my way into the family, they were, they, they see what a good earner you are, right? And, and you had the protection. I guess you had the protection of your uncle. I didn't have that protection. Well, mostly Cataldo because he was well-known. So he touched you. And when oh, you say yeah. touched you, it was, he, he let people know you were with yeah, him. Oh, yeah, street. yeah. He let Gotti yeah. know, everybody, yeah. Jimmy Burke, look, you can't he's have this me. guy. He, he's with me. He's yeah. on the record, he would say. Yeah. Where well, you're looking at it as a young kid, that's a badge of honor. You know, you're sticking right. your chest out. I'm trying to go, oh, shit. Like, you just, you know, I was called in and they went on the record with me to, to let them know, like, he's with us now. Yeah. And then the conversation was, look, from this point on, anywhere you go, you take off leg, you're sticking in the dirt. And before you even have a conversation about anything, you're moving in the street, you got to let them know you're with this boy, God, right. you're with this family. And I think that's when, in my case, I knew, oh man, this is going to, this is, this has the potential for ending really bad for me. Whereas the law enforcement agent side of me, I'm jumping for joy going, wow, not, nobody's ever gathered this type of intelligence yeah. before. Nobody's ever made these kind of tapes before. So there's that, it, it was an emotional roller coaster for me. Do you have aspirations to ever be made? Is my question to you. Uh, for a while I did, I think before I went to prison. And then I started to see what the life really was about. Yeah. And I was warned by this Icovetti guy who was a captain uh, in the Gambino family that it's all changing. He was already in his 60s. So, you know, when I got out, I did go visit him in the, in the 70s. He had a place in Connecticut. He had a big operation in Florida. And I brought him two guys that were made guys mm-hmm. from different families. And he, he gave each one of them 100000 to put out in the street. Oh. Cataldo and Terracone, Funzi Terracone. And then, you know, I had to stay away from him because I was dealing drugs. And I didn't see him anymore. And the interesting thing that happened to me, that was, let's say, 74, 5, like that. Ten years later, while I'm doing the Supreme Court judge in Florida making the payoff, Head of the FBI in Miami grabs a hold of my agent and says, bring him to a meeting. He said, we understand, we did research that you were really close with Dave Icovetti, mm. known as Davy Crockett down there. He's a captain in the Gambino family. I go, yeah, I haven't seen him for some years. Well, we want you to wear a wire and go visit him. I go, you know what? Yeah. They said, what? Never. But you're doing work for the government. Never. They go, Why? This man treated me like a son. He gave me great advice, and I'm not going to do it. And I don't care what you do. I'm never going to go visit him and wear a wire. Wow. What was the response? They were shocked. They thought like they had complete hold over me. Mm -hmm. When I went back with my FBI agent, Fen Russo, he said, wow, that says something about, about you. This is, you know, God, this is, that was 85. My God, that's. 39 years wow. ago. I go, I had no reason ever to turn on this guy. He gave me nothing but mentorship. He was a good guy. 
Uh, he was friends with Sinatra. When Sinatra came out of retirement, he sent me tickets. Yeah. I mean, he was just a good man. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't going to do it. Yeah. And so Russo, the agent, my FBI agent, said, man, you surprised me. Why? He said, I thought you came over completely. No, no, no. I have my own line. Sure. And that was it. Yeah, because you had respect for him. I think he realized yeah. he didn't want you to be in that life. And, right. you know, he could have victimized you and said, yeah, yeah. you should, yeah. you know. He could have been greedy like everybody else and yeah. said, yes, I'll take this, take this money, go in the I was and never going to do it. I yeah. didn't care what they threatened for you. me with. That's fascinating. And they left it alone. Yeah. You know? This isn't to sit here and glorify it. No, no, life, not at all. The underworld. It's and not- I could get a, an exciting energy, but it's not to glorify. I yeah. just like to tell, maybe tell the story like it was. You give a unique perspective on what it was like back then. Um, and I think you should be commended for your decision to walk away from the life on oh, your yeah. own independent before you know and realizing you were worth more you know your life was worth more than giving it to the underworld um and your insight to to inside the life you know being inside the life is just i think uh, i didn't have self-value no my self-value was in that in that life yeah 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 and that's what happens to a lot of people you know it starts to suck you in and once it sucks you in but but your character and your ability to see I'm being used or, you know, I, yeah. there's more to me that I have I can do. Oh, yeah. So, you know. A lot of things we did didn't make sense. But occasionally we did we did do the right things. We yeah. just didn't brag about them. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time being yeah, here today. Good. Thanks it's for doing the in-person interview yeah. with me and sitting down. And, yeah. Uh, I learned a lot, and I appreciate you sharing your stories with it, us. It was a time. You know, the 70s was such a time when I think about – I told Gail Clint King when I did a CBS interview, the 70s was secretive. She yeah. goes, how so? The mob, the movies, the music, baseball, nobody aired their laundry. Right. Today, everybody wants to get online. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But appreciate it. And remember, don't be robbing banks. <laughs> don't be doing carjackings, hijackings. <laughs> You'll get caught. It does, you, can't, you can't get away today no. what you, can't, you did in the 70s and 80s. So don't try it at home, folks. But thanks again, Sal. I appreciate you. For behind-the-scenes photos, merchandise, and exclusive content, visit InsideTheLife.org. Rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get podcasts.